the next uh, speaker is Jean Yu Liao from Berkeley. You're welcome to start. Thanks. Thanks. So, hey everyone, my name is Jen Yu Liao, and I'm happy to, to be here today to present some of our recent results on a data dependent theory of over parameterization, phase transition, double descent, and beyond. So, this is joint work with Homan Yi at University of Grenoble Helps and Michael Mahoney at UC Berkeley. And so here we go. Uh, uh, so I will be starting with a, 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 so before really going to machine learning and neural networks, I will start with a very much simpler example of um, estimating the covariance from um, random vectors. So say uh, if we have n data points and each of dimension P uh, that follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution of zero mean and covariance C, and we would like to estimate this population covariance C, that is the, of dimension P by P. And in this Gaussian setting, and we know that the maximum likelihood estimator is this sample covariance matrix given by this C hat. Um, and it's in general, so the, the best thing we can do, because we know that uh, we have this entry-wise convergence results saying that, so for a pair of IJ, we know that the sample covariance matrix C hats converge, so this entry converge entry wisely um, to the population covariance as the number of uh, data sample uh, n goes to infinity. This, this can be proved by the law of large numbers. So essentially it is the best thing we can do if we have a lot of samples. So basically if they, they, the, the data number of data sample n is much larger than the dimension P or in some sense for piece more. However, if we're working in the high dimensional region, so if we're working with P large, or in some sense it's N is approximately of the same order as P, then the, our conventional wisdom on the maximum likelihood estimator breaks down. So a very trivial example is in the case of the population covariance say is equal to identity, and in the case where we do not have much, um, uh, much samples, say, for example, n is small than the dimension p, then we know that the sample covariance, may, uh, sample covariance estimator, c hat, is of dimension p by p, but, and it's a, a, a sum of n rank one matrices, so here, and therefore it has at least p minus n zero eigenvalues. Uh, excuse me, uh, Jenu. Um, yes. I don't think we can see your slides. Actually, we can see the one slide okay. that says uh, 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 okay. sample covariance matrix in the large PN regime. Okay. Um, so perhaps I should stop share and share again. I guess. And if I do this, so can you see my slide move or? No? Yes, yes really. it works now. Thanks. Yes, now it's better. Okay, good, thanks. Yes. So um, so then in this region where MP are approximately of the same order, um, we know that there's mismatching the eigenvalues. So basically one is full rank and all the eigenvalues are equal to one and the sample currency matrix has at least uh, P minus and zero eigenvalues. So we have an eigenvalue mismatch. And this is essentially due to the fact that for large matrices, so for example, for matrices of dimension P by P, uh, entry-wise convergence results. So in fact, the norm, the, 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 the control of the infinite norm is not sufficient to control the operator norm due to the following P factor, which is now large in this norm inequality. And this leads to many fundamental results in random matrix theory. And for example, the machine code cobalt distribution. And I mentioned this slide because it's very important. We will say that in many neural, neural network like models, for example, random free features, it's exactly the same some phenomenon that's going to happen. So in fact, for, for machine learning um, systems that are large scale, uh, complex and large scale, we will say the same phenomenon happen and this leads to many counterintuitive behavior such as double descent. So quick reminder on random free features. 
So it's a typical random feature models. So we have, again, some have some data X and we multiply by some random standard Gaussian matrix W. And then we pass through two types of nonlinearity, so sine and cosine, and we obtain this uh, big sigma matrix that is a so-called random free feature matrix of our data X. And then we can do, for example, random free feature ridge regression on top of this random feature uh, using this beta vector. And this can be seen as a, as a toy example of a single hidden layer and the first layer is random, but a kind of very simple model for neural network analysis. And uh, many previous literature in the in the literature previous results established the entrywise again entrywise convergence of the random free feature gram matrix to the underlying Gaussian kernel as the number of neuron goes to infinity. So essentially, we know if the number of neuron is much much is super large, then we know we understand the behavior of random free feature. And this can be proved again by the law of large numbers. However, just as I mentioned in the first slide, so here a, again, the same, the same thing happens similar to the sample coherence matrix example. So this, com this entry-wise convergence results does not imply immediately a convergence in spectral norm. So we cannot say that the random free feature gram matrix is close to the Gaussian kernel matrix unless the number of neurons capital N is much, much larger than your, uh, the number of your data points. We can use a rank argument to, 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 to prove this. It's pretty trivial, I would say. And this has a significant impact on various random free feature-based algorithms because, in fact, it's really the spectral norm that we need to control to understand, for example, the MSE of in, in, in random free feature ridge regression, for example. Here I have a plot. So the blue circles are empirical results, the training MSEs um, of random free ridge regression as a function of the ridge par parameter lambda on real world data. So here are amnes data. And the black dashed lines are the theoretical guarantee offered by Gaussian kernel. We say there is a mismatch and the, the mismatch is pretty large if the number of neuron capital N is somehow small and for small regulation. However, we can use random matrix theory to derive this red line, which perfectly match uh, empirical results for arbitrary ratio and for arbitrary regression parameters. And building on top of the theoretical results, we can provide precise training and test performance for random free feature for any ratio, um, capital over small n, and almost rewarded as a way have a, some assumptions, but pretty mild on, on the data distribution. Here is a plot on the MSE training and test for various lambda and uh, ratio, our real world data again. And if we focus on the test MSE and the plot as a function of the ratio capital or small m, we observe, uh, we can prove in fact the double, the double descent phenomenon, our real world data. So to conclude, uh, um, do we have double descent test curve on real world data? Yes, the answer is yes. And we prove here for random free feature model. And hopefully for this can be extend to more involved models, at least random feature based. And this is essentially due to a phase transition from the under to over parameter of the so-called resolvent matrix of the random free feature gram matrix in the limits where the regulation parameter goes to zero. And some takeaway messages. So for large matrices, for large machine learning systems that, that are, um, that's of interest, entry-wise convergence does not immediately imply a spectral norm convergence. And we say this in the example of the sample coherence matrix, and we say this in the random feature model as well. And random matrix theory provides a tool to understand those overparameterized large scale machine learning system our reward data. And here's a reference. And, and, and thank you for your time and your attention. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I see there are no questions. And also, you actually 
took the time of the question for your presentation. So uh, thank you very much. This is very interesting. We will continue thank to you. the next lightning talk, which is by Akshay Rangaman. Wait a second. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, I'm yeah. here. Can uh, you share your screen, Akshay? Sure. Uh, I'm unable to start my video though. Is that okay? Okay, it will be resolved in within 10 seconds. Okay. I assume. Yeah. Do, do you see my screen? Yes, thank you very much. So from now on, let's really try to keep in the five minute limit. After five and a half minutes, I will I will uh, say something that like you are exceeding your time, not only you for, for the next lightning talks, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm uh, Akshay Rangmani. I'm uh, here to talk about our uh, work on stability of kernel less regression. And uh, this is joint work with Lorenzo Rosasco and uh, Tommaso Portio at MIT. Um, so, uh, the our, our motivation for our work is uh, similar to that of the workshop itself, uh, in that we'd like to understand. Um, uh, how generalization happens in uh, high dimensional uh, learning problems, which are uh, over parameterized with lots more parameters and uh, uh, parameters than uh, number of training samples available for uh, fitting your data. And um, uh, we uh, choose to study the uh, unregularized uh, high dimensional linear and kernel least squares problems. Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, we were trying to understand why certain approaches like selecting the minimum norm solution are a good idea. And there's been a lot of uh, good recent work in, uh, in this area, uh, trying to provide um, really uh, tight bonds. Uh, we approach this uh, problem from the perspective of uh, the algorithmic stability of a machine learning problem. So uh, just to set up the notation, we're in the supervised learning setting uh, in the, uh, and our, uh, uh, we consider the, uh, minimizing the least squares, um, uh, the uh, square loss, over a data set um, and uh, 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 we restrict our hypothesis class to be a reproducing kernel in bit space associated with, associated with the kernel. And uh, uh, the data uh, that we're considering comes from uh, um, a feature space in RD and uh, we're trying to predict uh, uh, labels. This could be a, a regression or a classification problem, but uh, we uh, try to predict uh, scalar labels. And uh, the loss function uh, incurred by a hypothesis f on a sample z is v of f c, and uh, it's the squared loss that we're uh, considering. And um, the expected risk uh, is denoted by i of f, and empirical risk is i s. Um, and the notion of stability, uh, there are many different uh, definitions of stability, and the, uh, we uh, were choosing to study uh, a notion called uh, expected uh, cross-validation Levonaut stability. This was uh, uh, this is the one focused on in uh, uh, this uh, paper from 2006 by Mukherjee et al., which uh, showed the uh, showed that um, CB uh, Levonaut stability is uh, uh, implies uniform uh, convergence and uh, consistency of ERM. And uh, the definition of uh, uh, CB Levonaut stability is um, basically that the difference between um, the predictor learned by an algorithm. On the leave out data set versus the uh, versus the original data set is uh, uh, is bounded above by uh, quantity beta, and this is a slightly weaker notion of stability than uh, than the uniform stability that's usually studied, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's that's been used to give uh, guarantees on the generalization of kernel ridge regression. And uh, this uh, notion of CV leave out stability is interesting because it provides a bound on the uh, excess risk in the case of uh, ERM. So uh, to uh, explicitly uh, set out the problem, we're looking at the ERM problem for uh, ridgeless regression. So minimizing uh, functions over the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And since this is a, a simple enough uh, uh, setting, we can explicitly write out all interpolating solutions to this problem. And uh, uh, by the representative theorem, we can represent it, uh, the solution uh, over uh, uh, kernel evaluations on the training set, and the coefficients are given by this uh, uh, expression. Here, uh, bold uh, face K is the empirical kernel matrix, uh, bold face Y is the collection of uh, uh, targets, and uh, bold face uh, V is, uh, is any arbitrary vector. 
And out of the many solutions to ERM, it is common to choose the minimum norm uh, RKHS solution. So our main result is uh, using uh, some simple linear algebra and uh, analyzing the uh, interpolating, uh, the form of the interpolating solutions on uh, the training the, uh, on the uh, uh, ERM problem to give uh, a bound on the uh, CV Lebanon uh, stability of, uh, of uh, kernel uh, ridgeless regression. And uh, we have the, uh, the exact expression over here is a little uh, unwieldy, so I'm uh, hiding it. But uh, the important part over here is that um, the, uh, our, uh, our bound on the stability is minimized when, uh, the, uh, when B equals B i equals 0. And uh, here, B and B i are the corresponding para, uh, uh, vectors that uh, are arbitrary vectors that parameterize the uh, full solution and the solution of the Lebanon data set. So when you set both of them to zero, you get the minimum norm solution. So the uh, minimum uh, norm solutions optimize the uh, stability, CV Lebanon stability of uh, rigorous regression. And uh, for the minimum norm solutions, we uh, we can explicitly uh, uh, characterize the uh, the bound on the stability. And uh, there are uh, two terms here. Um, both are more or less the same. One is the square of the other, and uh, uh, the important uh, part over here to note is that the condition number of the kernel matrix appears in the uh, in our bound. And um, uh, as we uh, know from uh, linear algebra, the uh, condition number of a uh, of a uh, matrix is usually uh, in involved in the numerical stability of uh, of solving that uh, regression problem. Here um, uh, we're uh, showing a link between the condition number and algorithmic stability as well. So uh, uh, just to uh, note a couple of uh, points about our uh, results, our uh, bonds establish a link between minimizing the norm and optimizing stability. Um, Actually, you are approaching six minutes. OK. okay. Uh, for fixed, uh, I'll quickly get through this. Uh, for uh, fixed DNN, the uh, condition number of the kernel increases and stability is lost, so we need to regularize. But in the regime where uh, D and N both uh, go to infinity, but uh, they get to a constant. We can use uh, random matrix theory to obtain an asymptotic limit. So uh, we also uh, perform some simulations to note that, uh, to check uh, that uh, out of all interpolating solutions, the minimum norm solutions minimizes the stability on the right, as well as the test uh, error. And in the case of uh, kernel least squares, uh, where we were uh, um, uh, in two different settings um, with RBF kernels and polynomial kernels, we show that the, uh, we were able to verify that the uh, test MSE is, uh, test mean squared error is correlated with the condition number. So uh, that concludes our, uh, 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 this talk and um, uh, here are some references and uh, thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. You actually took the seven minutes, but if there is a quick question, so you are welcome. Are there any questions? Okay, so let's just continue to the next lightning talk because we are exceeding over yeah. the, the time. So thank you very much, actually. This was very interesting. Thank you. Okay, our next talk is... Our next talk is by uh, Ji Tong Yang from Berkeley also on exact gap between generalization error and the uniform co convergence in random feature models. Okay, you can share your screen. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks everyone for coming to the presentation. Uh, in the next five minutes, I will talk about my uh, recent work with Yubai from Salesforce and Sumei from Berkeley. Our paper is available online and you can find it using the link below. Uh, we will talk about uh, uniform convergence. So recall that given a training set of size n, we care about this generalization error, which is the difference between test loss and training loss. And the one way to understand the generalization error is by taking suprema over the entire function class. And this is known as uniform convergence. Extensive literatures have shown that uniform convergence is proportional to the square root of some complexity measure of f. And uh, uh, uniform convergence are known to be unable to explain generalization in deep networks because the function class is so complex. And the one concrete mode uniform convergence could fail is described in this paper by Nagarajan and Coulter. Uh, they find that uh, while in practice for deep networks with more training samples, the generalization error will decrease. 
but uniform convergence will increase with the number of samples. And uh, this is that uniform convergence cannot explain generalization for deep networks. And the one way to remedy this is to consider a smaller set, the capacity reduced the class of functions. And uh, by taking Suprema over this smaller set, we hope to get a tighter bound. And uh, uh, as deep networks interpolate, a natural class to con con consider is a class of interpolating solutions, meaning that we take Suprema over uh, all the functions in the class, but only consider those that could interpolate the training set. Then a natural question is, uh, how does uniform convergence uh, over interpolators look like in this uh, generalization picture? And uh, uh, more generally, we want to ask, what is the exact gap between the generalization error the uniform convergence and some capacity reduce the uniform convergence. We will answer this question in the setting of random features model. Uh, this model have appeared several times today, uh, but to repeat, uh, theta j is a random weight for the first layer. And uh, 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 during the training, uh, we keep the first layer fixed and only train the second layer. Uh, there are two important parameters in this model. First is n, which is the width of the two layer network, also the number of the features. And the second is A, which is the maximum norm allowed for the second layer. And uh, we assume our data follow some particular distributions. And here now that YI, it's a, a noisy observation of some ground truth signal theta star. And the, the noise level is tau square. Uh, this tau square will appear later in the talk. Then uh, with the distribution and, and the training set, we can define the training loss and the test loss. Uh, then now that uh, when we have uh, when the number of features is larger than the number of training samples, the minimum norm interpolator will exist with high probability, and uh, uh, we will denote this by a mean. Then let's go back to our question: How does this three quantity look like in the setting of random features model? So the generalization error is just the test loss minus the training loss, and in this setting, the training loss is just zero. The uniform convergence again is taking suprema over the entire function class. And in this case, uh, the function class uh, is just the, the, norm, the, the, the norm, norm ball for the second layer. And uh, the uniform convergence over interpolators is by taking Suprema over the same norm ball, but only include those that could interpolate the training set. Uh, next, uh, when compare these three quantities, an important question is what choice of A we should make here. And here we choose A to be a number that is slightly larger than the minimum norm required to interpolate the training set. Because if we do not uh, enforce this requirement, the optimization program that defines T will have an empty feasible region. And, uh, we, uh, and uh, if we do this, we make sure everything is well defined. Next, we consider the proportional limit regime. And here, uh, Psi1 can be think of as a surrogate for the number of features and Psi2 as a surrogate for the uh, number of training samples. And uh, making uh, these assumptions allows us to do exact computations about uniform convergence instead of non-asymptotic upper or lower bounds. Then we are ready to state the mean result of the paper. The mean result is the analytical expression of these three quantities. And uh, what we find is that when the number of features, uh, when the number of sam samples increases, all these three quantities will converge to zero in the noiseless regime, but they converge to zero at very different rate. And uh, with our exact computation, we can find the, the exact gap between the rate of convergence. And also, uh, in addition to that, in the noisy re re regime, we obtain a different behavior. In this case, the uniform convergence will actually diverge with the number of samples. And this echoes the finding of Nagaraja and Coulter. And interestingly, uh, the uniform convergence over interpolators will converge to a constant. And this is saying that uniform convergence over interpolators is sort of a boundary between diverging and converging uniform convergence. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks everyone for coming. That's uh, all I have prepared. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Questions? Okay, so yeah. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's continue to the next lightning talk because we are out of time, we're exceeding out of time anyway. Uh, so the next talk is by Inbar Sarusi from Weizmann Institute. Yeah, hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Can you share your screen? Hi.
Thanks. All right. So hi everyone. Uh, our work uh, proposed a lower bound on uh, the generalization error for a uh, non-linear mo model going beyond random features and, and linear models. This is a joint work with the Ophel Zaitouni from the Weizmann Institute. So why basically lower bound? Because as you saw, calculating the generalization error is possible only in, in two examples. And maybe if we have such lower one bound, it can provide some guidelines and benchmarks to, to, to improve our design. And then as I will show you, we can understand some characteristic properties and limitation of the model that we are studying. And this is in parallel to the existing upper bound in the literature that are based on the complexity measure. And we would like to propose a bound that will be uh, for any uh, algorithm. All right, so a bit of convention and notation. We are working with a supervised learning problem. We have trained data which, which you compose of n ILE noisy samples where the true function is f of theta. And, um, and basically we, are, we also have a test set which is not noisy. And our goal here is to find an estimator y hat, which is a function of a new example, a new feature example, and my training data, which minimize my risk. In, and for this talk, we consider the mean square error. All right, and this is already suffice to state uh, our first theorem, which states that for any unbiased estimator, the generalization error is bounded by, by the expected rank of the Fisher information matrix, which is a well-known matrix in information uh, theory divided by the number of samples. And this is somehow complementary to what you, uh, you, you have seen today, basically, uh, the rank is a very sensitive object to, sm uh, to small eigenvalues. And as, as I will show you now, it's uh, in the over-parameterized regime, the rank is very large. So, so what, what happened, let's say, if my f of theta is, is a neural network and starting with the simple case of a linear neural network. So in this case, uh, the expected rank of the Fisher information matrix will be uh, the, the rank of my uh, covari uh, covariance matrix. So this is true for any numbers of layers. And, this, and the intuition for that is that essentially we are um, estimating a linear uh, model. And now what have, uh, and, and now if my if my covariance matrix is identity, then then my rank will be D. And if my feature vector is very large, then then uh, my estimation will be poor. So now what happened in the nonlinear case? So in this case, we prove that the expected rank will be of the order of the number of parameters in my model. So so for neural network, that would be something like order D squared. Meaning that uh, that the nonlinearity actually increases uh, the rank of the Fisher information matrix, and therefore the requirement of unbiasedness is not a reasonable requirement. So, so small bias can actually improve uh, your generalization. So what um, so what can we say? So we provide a bound for any uh, estimator. So working with the same, same convention as before, but now our data was generated from, from some neural uh, uh, network. And, uh, and, we, and we are working in this over-parameterized uh, regime in which the number of uh, neuron in each uh, layer is of the order of the number of samples. So uh, we provide a bound in, of, for which we calculate using random matrix theory. And, and so this, is, will, this will be uh, true for any estimator, uh, presumably with another architecture. So the important point is how, how is this bound will be comparable to, to, actual, uh, um, to, uh, to actual estimators. So here we compare the bound, for, for, for example, for stochastic gradient descent. So what you see here is the, is, um, the generalization error of stochastic gradient descent versus uh, the ratio between the input size and the number of, of samples. So, so you, you can see indeed that, that's, that SGD is biased. So in green, I, I plot here the bias of SGD. And you can see that the bound is, in, is in, in scalable, is in the same scale as 
as a, as SGD, and this is without even optimizing the parameters of, of SGD, and and it really depends on the uh, on the and the model parameters. So so you can see that if I actually change the noise, then 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 the binary even get closer. So it's an interesting point and to to understand how how can we reach this uh, uh, gap. So thank you very much uh, uh, for your attention. And if you have any question, and he, I, I attach here our ref, uh, the reference to our paper. Okay, thank you very much, Inbar. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, I see there is a question. Um, yeah, so I will give you permission to speak, to ask it by yourself. Okay, it's actually a short question from the audience, from, from Amir Weiss. Is it bias or bias squared in units? You can see it in the Q&A. You mean, the, um, yeah, it's a bias squared. You mean in my, in my experiment? You mean? Yeah. Yes, here is the bias squared. Okay, did it, was the question answered, Amir? Yeah, yeah, I assume. Okay, so I, okay, there is, no, there is no, okay. Um, I have a question. You're saying that you have a lower bound for any estimator. So essentially this is a big statement, of course. So what do you lose from the fact that you, what you actually lose from the fact that this is such a generic bound, like such a general ability? All right, so, so basically I have already, I have, I have assumption on my data that, that uh, it was generated from a neural network, but this I think is not such a big assumption um, for that case. But what, what, do, what we lose is essentially this, uh, this uh, if you have some, some, some uh, limitation on your estimator, then, then you can improve this gap, for example, or you can, you can work something. So this is something that I think will be interesting to, to explore further if, if there is estimator that achieve this bound. So, okay. so this is a, an interesting direction for future work. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting work. So now we'll proceed to the next lightning talk, uh, which is by Yu San from the University of Washington. It's about towards sample efficient over parameterized meta learning. It should be very interesting. Uh, you can you share your screen, please? I'm sorry, I cannot share it now. Uh, okay. I'll try it now. Now we should be able to share, I think. Can you see my screen? Okay, yeah. thank you very much. You, the stage is yours. <laughs> thank you. So yeah, I'm Yusun, and today I will talk about over parameterized meta learning. Uh, let's see. Uh, so what is meta learning? As an introduction, meta learning usually contains two steps. First, a representation learning, or in short, rep learning. Second phase, uh, future learning. In the first stage, we have a large data set containing a lot of tasks that we want to learn. And we can directly observe the features and labels corresponding to these tasks. Because we have a large data set, then we can train a large model accurately containing a lot of parameters. In the second step, uh, there is a small data set containing a new task, one new task to be learned, and still we can observe the features and labels corresponding to the new task. As the data set is small, but the model is large, so it's over parameterized, but empirically, it can still do some fine tuning and it works very well on this small data set. So for this talk, I will just introduce the linear uh, subspace-based uh, meta learning. So here is an uh, animation corresponding to it. First, a rep learning. And we assume that task is ID generated from a task distribution for simplicity. It's just a, a normal distribution with some covariance. And uh, we cannot observe it directly. Instead, we can generate some features from some Gaussian distribution corresponding to every task, also ID features. And also we can compute the labels, Y, which is jointly linear in feature X and uh, task beta. So basically we can observe X and Y only and we, in this stage, we want to learn some uh, information about task. For example, estimate the covariance of task, or if the task covariance is low rank, then basically we can also try to learn the span of sigma beta. And in the next step, we have a new task beta to be learned, and still we can generate the features and compute the labels. 
And the catch is that the new tasks come from the same task distribution and we want to learn it. So in this step, you can observe the X feature and label Y and uh, use the pre-trained information such as head sigma beta to learn about the new task. So here is the thing. And basically what we want to use is that if the sigma beta is low rank, then basically the search space for the next stage is smaller then we can do our parent tries learning. So in the first step, we want to estimate sigma beta, the covariance of task. And the question is that, so what property of feature and task covariance can guarantee good or parameterized learning? In previous works in this subspace-based uh, meta-learning, so it's just usually for simplicity assumed that sigma x, the feature covariance at its identity. But we know from our parent transition theory that spike feature covariance can sometimes help. And so our, our contribution is a general analysis for feature task covariance, and especially it works well for feature task alignment. So what does that mean and what's the motivation of it? Here is the kind of a motivation example, motivating example. Suppose there is a kind of classification problem and we have three clusters. This is the feature space. Each task uh, is a binary classification. So we draw a decision boundary, which are the kind of hyperplanes and the task vectors beta are just a normal vector of these decision boundaries. And we're interested in that the span of center is smaller than the dimension of the whole space. And we can see that the task vectors are just in this subspace of the span of center. So it's low dimensional. And also if we look at the, the coherence of the features, it's span most, uh, the energy is mostly also in this subspace as compared to like in the perpendicular direction, it has like very small coherence, like uh, energy. So basically the coherence, the uh, principal subspace of the coherence of feature and task, they are the same subspace. So our contribution for rep learning is we introduced two estimators. MOM stands for a method of moment. So we estimate the moment, like moment of beta, basically sigma beta. And it's quite general, but we just give this as a simple example to illustrate. And we give the sample complexity analysis for like both total sample complexity and the number of sample per task requirement for these two things. And uh, the uh, catch is that suppose the total dimension is d-dimensional and the sigma x is, is, if alpha, this thing is more than one. So the basic, the principal subspace of these two covariances are both r-dimensional and they overlap. So here is a table uh, for two specific things. The method of moment, I think for this thing, this already shows in previous works and we have the other uh, things in this table and we can see that. So we have analysis for both uh, both estimators and we can see that really it uh, saves some complexity in this uh, align the task and feature things. And most generally is this line. And basically by our parameter transition, we mean that because the like R dimensional subspace in D dimensional total space is kind of the com complexity degree of freedom is R times D, but if there is a, kind of alignment, basically we only need R square or R, R to cube samples. So if R is small, then basically it's over parent tries. Due to time constraints, we cannot uh, speak about this result, but for future learning, if we have like estimated uh, feature covariance, we can still, yeah, like in previous works, they just use PCA and low dimensional representation, but we can also do it in parameterized way using weighted over parameterized representation and like minimum solution of the like, uh, these squares, we can still um, do it our parent price learning in future learning. So that's all for my talk. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there, there is a question from the from the audience. It's actually an anonymous question. So uh, yes, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, this is a good, good question because due to constraint of time, we can at least all the uh, related, related works, but this work is definitely related. And I think this work is kind of, uh, first, uh, I think this only covers a matrix factorization type of thing, but there is no uh, algorithm in it. So if you want some like algorithm, I think there is a paper by Chi Jin and Chi Bayani, and there are some, some authors, that paper is also related. And I think that paper um, talks about, also is kind of, uh, 
I would say not dig so much into the uh, feature task alignment and the over parameterizing thing, maybe. So we emphasize this kind of gen gen generality to kind of arbitrary covariance. And the kind of, we also have the end to end analysis for like from the beginning. So we have the rep learning and we have the future learning and together what is the error and some complexity for them. But yeah, there is definitely some like more discussion that I cannot present today. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Okay, thank you very much. So now let's proceed to the next lightning talk by Juran Yang from Princeton University. Uh, okay. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to present my work on the my recent work on the sample efficiency uh, of reinforced learning in the context of functional approximation. And this is a joint work with uh, Chi Jin, uh, Professor Chi Jin, Professor Jaran Wan, and Professor Mandy Wang, and Professor Mac Jordan from Berkeley. And this paper is available on our archive, and the short version appeared in NeurIPS 2020. And the work, this work aims to address the sample efficiency challenge of deep reinforced learning. Uh, we all know that deep reinforced learning uh, recently has achieved uh, great empirical success. Um, but these methods are very data hungry. The number of data required is an astronomical number. Uh, but in, in practice, we usually have limited data and it can be very challenging uh, to build a good simulator which is close to the real environment or acquire new data from the environment. And then applying uh, those existing uh, deep RL algorithms to those uh, scenarios might result in a policy which performs poorly. And besides, a massive data also requires massive computation. So if we don't have enough computational power, then perhaps we don't have enough time to wait for convergence to happen. And so this non-convergence is an, another source of unreliability uh, caused by sample, efficiency, uh, sample inefficiency of existing deep RL algorithms. So uh, as a summary, when we try to apply deep RL uh, to problems in critical domains, such as personalized finance, personalized medicine, and autonomous driving, um, once the learning algorithm is unreliable, the potential cost will be huge. So the goal of this work is to bring sample efficiency to reinforced learning. And specifically, uh, we would like to design an algorithm which is both computational and sample efficient. And we focus on the online setting where the reinforced learning agent learns in a trial and error fashion. So by interacting with the environment and learn from its past experiences. So to achieve sample efficiency in this very online setup, we need to address the fundamental challenge of exploration versus exploitation. Uh, so here exploration is called deep exploration because we are dealing with a sequential decision-making problem and once, whenever we take an action, we need to take into consideration of the future effect. Also, we would like to be able to handle high dimensional inputs by incorporating function, powerful function approximation tools such as neural networks and kernel functions. And so in the context, uh, so in terms of algorithm design, because we use function approximators and our data is, uh, is adaptive, uh, the first question we need to answer is how to assess the estimation uncertainty based on this adaptive, adaptive data. And second, more importantly, we need to address the exploration challenge. So we need to construct exploration incentives that are tailored to functional approximators. And in terms of the, our theoretical results, uh, we propose the first neural network-based reinforced learning algorithm, which achieves both sample and computational efficiency. And this, and moreover, this algorithm, in terms of algorithm design, uh, it can incorporate very general, um, many general function approximators, including over-parameterized neural networks and RKHS, and even linear function, and also linear function as a, as a special case. And in terms of algorithm design, it's, uh, it's based on a classical algorithm called least squares value iteration, which solves the reinforced learning problem by fitting a sequence of least squares, least square regression problems. But our, uh, the novelty of, of our algorithm is to additionally conduct uncertainty quantification for the least square solutions. That is constructing high probability confidence regions 
around the least square solutions that contains the ground truth. And to do this, uh, we propose to focus on the class of over-parameterized neural networks and construct the high-probability confidence region uh, using the neural tangent features. So when the uh, uh, when over-parameterized neural network is used, both the least square, so least square regression problem and the uncertainty quantification can be computed efficiently. And then we propose to use uncertainty as an exploration bonus and add it to the least square solution, to the least square solution and to construct an upper confidence bound. So here in this figure, this blue line stands for the least square solution and this shaded area uh, stands for the uncertainty quantifier. And then we propose to add this uncertainty to the least square solution and get this upper confidence bound. And finally, we propose to use the greedy policy with respect to the upper confidence, confidence bound to come up with an updated policy. And this algorithm, uh, and by doing this, we directly strike a balance between exploration and, and exploitation. And intuitively, once, whenever we make a decision, it's either because the least square solution is, has a, has a high, high value, which means that we are exploiting the existing information, or it's because uncertainty is large. In that case, uh, we try to, um, uh, we are doing exploration. And we show, we theoretically, we show that this algorithm achieves sample efficiency by having a square root of t regret. And it depends on the size of the problem uh, polynomially. Here, H is a number of steps within each MDP, and delta F quantifies the, the, complex, the underlying complexity of the function class. When the overparameterized neural network is used, this term can be computed using the eigenvalue decay of the neural tangent kernel. And this algorithm is also computationally efficient in the sense that it can be computed in polynomial time. And we uh, for and the only assumption in this work is that the uh, the regression target lies in the kernel fun kernel function class induced by the neural tangent kernel. There's no assumption in terms of in terms of the sampling paradigm. And in the interest of time, I will uh, skip the detail of the proof, and I would like to conclude that this work proposes an optimistic uh, least square value iteration algorithm, which uh, incorporates. A neural, a neural network first in, in a, for the first time in the reinforced learning literature. And this work is, this algorithm is, achieves both statistic, uh, sample and computational efficiency. Uh, so I'll conclude, uh, I'll uh, stop here and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience or the Zoom panelists? Okay. so. Actually, your work is very unique in this workshop because if, if I remember correctly, it's the only work about reinforcement learning. So I have a general question to you. Do you think that in over-parameterized reinforcement learning should be a double descent phenomena? And if so, should it be, how it should be related to a, to a regular learning, supervised learning setting? Um. For this, I don't think, uh, well, in, in, the, in our algorithm, we don't have this uh, double descent phenomenon because in the least square solution, uh, in fitting the least square solution, we are using rich regression. Mm -hmm. So once the regularization is used, yeah, there's no uh, interpolation. But it will be, uh, but th this is because uh, for the sake of, of theoretical analysis. So um, can you implement it as a ridgeless uh, regression? Without regularization, uh, you you can, but um, but we so for this work, the most important thing is to conduct uncertain quantification, and we don't know how to do this for the ridgeless solution. Okay, we actually have two questions from the audience, so I can let them ask by themselves. Uh, okay. Okay, the first one is by Jirian Wang. You can ask it by yourself, I think. Yeah. Okay. Can you give some intuition on what it means for the true function to lie in the RKH of the NTK? Okay, sorry, I don't have a microphone. 
Oh, uh, I see. So uh, this argument, uh, this is about the, the, so the regression target is the right-hand side of the Bellman's equation. It's this Bellman operator uh, operates on the uh, Q function, value function associated with the next step, uh, next step H plus one. And so this, in, 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 mathematically, this is computed using a, using an integral. And it's a function of the, this Bellman operator maps each function, value function from the, the function class to the function class. So we assume that the image of the Bellman's operator lies in the kernel space. This kernel is the kernel space induced by the uh, neural tangent kernel. The neural tangent kernel is uh, just the expected value of the, the, the gradient of the neural, neural network uh, with respect to the, the weights. And uh, assuming the weights are initialized from a, from a random distribution. Okay, thank so, you. So in, in order for, for this, uh, in, intuitively, you know, a sufficient condition for this assumption to hold is that the transition, both the reward function and the Markov transition kernel has a represent, can be written as a, as a, as an integral uh, in the function class. Well, intuitively, it, it means that the, uh, the, both the reward function and, the, and first the, the reward function lies in the RKHS. And then finally, and in addition for each future state as prime, uh, the transition kernel lies in the, uh, lies in the RKHS for as a current state and current action. That is for any fixed the future st future state. If we view the transition kernel as a, as a function of current state and current action, it lies in the RKHS. Okay, thank you. There, if you can answer quickly, there is an additional question by Mariam Faisal. What's the difference between delta f and df? Uh, Delta F. Oh, okay. so Delta here is, Delta F basically uh, is uh, is this term. It's uh, I it stands for the uh, it involves both the effective dimension of the NTK and the log covering number. So we have these two measures of complexity because of the proof, uh, because of proof technique we use. Uh, so. Both, but both of these two terms can be computed if we impose certain uh, eigenvalue uh, decay condition of the, of the NTK. And also in our paper, we have a few uh, examples of NTKs where we, where, which satisfy the uh, finite, uh, finite rank and uh, exponential decay and polynomial decay. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's proceed to the to the last uh, lightning talk in this session. Uh, this talk will be presented by Masaki Maizumi from the University of Tokyo and Riken AIP. Masaki, can you share your screen, please? Yes, I'm not trying to. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm. Oh, yeah. Can you see see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Masaki Maizumi from the University of Tokyo. Oh, so it's early morning. So it's I mean I mean very sleepy here now. So and first of all, it's Arjuna Nakata from the Rutgers University. And uh, so today we will talk about uh, this paper. The slightly modified. Uh, uh, title is slightly modified, but the uh, very interest is the kind of the I mean, kind of double digit like uh, symptomatic risk for the um, kind of the I mean nonlinear general class of nonlinear models. That's our interest. So yeah. Oh, I'm going to. Uh, yes. So the other interest is the kind of the, the I mean, asymptotic risk, like, uh, I mean, the body sense or something for the I mean, general class of nonlinear models, including some certain class of the deep neural networks at uh, this limit, like uh, the number of sample size and number of the parameters going to infinity. So as you know, so many very great, great works on the asymptotic risk analysis, but uh, many of them focus on in the kind of time linear model, like a random feature model or linear regression or something. So, so we try to extend their uh, nice, very great results to the more general class of nonlinear models. And my, our, our key idea is to 
apply the property of the likelihood models. So we can decompose the Fisher information matrix into some convenient form and I derive some, some bounds, risk bounds, like uh, which can describe the both, I mean, double descents and another asymptotic ridge curve. So, and we will show that the, our results can be applicable to some, uh, some class of the deep nets, including the parallelized deep neural nets and the reason net. Yeah. So this is the setting, I think very simple. So like uh, F star be a, uh, a likelihood model and the theta is a p-dimensional parameter and z, z, uh, z is a data like a pair of the input and output and we uh, allow that f star can be a I mean, non-linear uh, function in theta like a, if theta can be I mean, squared loss of the uh, square root of each the, of the uh, regression loss or something and let z1 to z N is some, I mean, IID N observations, which is generated from the F theta star. So if theta star is a common density function and theta star is some existing true parameter, and we consider this estimation problem like uh, the penalized uh, maximum likelihood estimation problem. Like a theta hat is a minimizer of the negative log likelihood uh, plus some penalty term. And the tau is a penalty coefficient. And we want to uh, study the difference or some risks between the F star, uh, theta hat and the theta star at the limit of, of this, uh, this, this constraint, like uh, P over N, the converge to the gamma. And of course, I and mean, P diverges to infinity. And this is my, uh, one of the main results. So we firstly, we consider the kind of the bias, variance decomposition of the, this difference between the theta star and theta hat, like a V is a variance and B is a bias. And we show that uh, the, some norm, kind of the norm of the variance term is, I mean, asymptotically bounded by this term, like a limit of H. And H is, uh, we, we don't have much time to explain this detail, but I say H is the kind of the extended version of the steady chest transform of a spectral measure of the limit of the Fisher info matrix of the likelihood models. And uh, the shape of this H depends on the tau bar, which is a limit of the penalty coefficient. And if tau bar is zero, so the H can describe the double descent curve. And if H uh, tau bar is a positive, so H described this uh, some curve which described the sympathetic risk of the rich regression. Like uh, this is uh, the, this bit, uh, yeah. And this curve are both consistent with some existence uh, a, a previous uh, some analysis on the linear regression or something. And we also studied another risk, like uh, estimation risk, which includes both um, bias, bias and variance. Like uh, this is a variance term. This is about the bias term. Of course, the bias term also remains, but uh, it's very, I mean, usual in the double this analysis, I believe. And of course, we can uh, analyze the more another type of the risk, like a prediction risk or something. And of course, the, we need some assumptions. So, and we have may have the mainly four assumptions, one, two, three, four. And one of the principal one is the assumption three, which describes the kind of the vanishing third derivative assumption. Like a large U is kind of the third order, I mean, higher order Hessian matrix or tensor. At large U is the third order derivative tensor. And we assume that the spectral norm or an um, operator norm of the U and the Lipschitz constant of U is, I mean, vanishing as the limit of the over parameter limits. That's the, our my principal assumption. And, and the next question is that which model can satisfy this assumption? And that this is our, our uh, answer. So we picked uh, several models which can satisfy our assumption, like a linear regression, and the parallelized version of the deep neural networks and the rich neural networks, which is the follows the, this result and the ensemble learning. And intuitively speaking, so if we consider some parallelized type of the deep nets, so if this case, in that case, the large U, which is the higher or the derivative tensor, is a blockwise sparse, and this sparse I mean, tensor can satisfy our assumption three. Yeah. Okay. So this is our last slide. So our interest is a simple analysis of the risk of the regularized MLE in the uh, with the nonlinear 
models, and we show that uh, we left a bound for the double descent curve under which curve. And we show that several uh, models, including deep models, some, ty some type of deep models can satisfy our assumption. And our one line message is that some class of the deep models can enjoy the double descent phenomena in the theoretical sense. And this is our full paper. So if you're interested, please check this out. Yeah, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. It's a, it's a strong statement that some deep models can enjoy double descent. Yeah, so it's ah, yes, yeah, that was sort of a simple statement, yeah. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, I have one. This is Daniel yeah. Lejeune. Daniel. Yes, please. Um, so what you have is an upper bound, and I think this is tight yes, in yes. Uh, the least squares case when the uh, Fisher information is just the data covariance, right? Um, yes, yes, yes. And it, do you have any sense of how tight this is in these other settings? So is that with the, the this uh, extra assumption that you have, does that inform uh, on tightness? Uh, yeah, uh, tightness is a kind of the critical, I mean, issue. So, well, the one first, uh, yeah, we don't, actually we have, we don't have a very clear answer about the question, but uh, uh, one point is that uh, if the linear regression uh, our bound corresponds to the uh, exact risk of the linear regression. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, so, so that, that's the one, I mean, some sub evidence for the tightness of our result, but uh, we have, we do not have a formal result. So that's the next um, concern of our uh, study. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience? Okay, so thank you very much, Masaki. Yeah, thank you very uh, much. Yeah, so your lightning talk concludes this session of lightning talks. Um, we will now have, I think, 17 minutes of break until 2 p.m. Pacific time, where the invited talk by uh, Rob Nowak will start. And after his invited talk, we will have another session of uh, lightning talks that will be more focused on only, which will be focused only on over-parameterized classification problems. Uh, okay, so see you all in 17 minutes in the invited talk. We have a break now, thanks. <laughs>